Good evening, everyone. My name is Thane Rosenbaum. I'm the creative director of the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society at Turo College. And welcome to the Folks Film Series. Tonight, A Call to Spy, a new film that opens nationally through select theaters on October 2nd. It's part of our summer of advanced screenings where a select number of our audience members on Folks have an opportunity to watch the film. And then we get a chance to actually speak to the filmmakers and the creative team. Uh, we did earlier this summer, The Cuban, uh, and then we did The Secrets We Keep. Uh, and in most cases, these were films that were held up in distribution because of COVID. And so we're th so thrilled to have provided an opportunity to view the film. And as you know, in the style of folks to talk about the big ideas within the film. The creative team tonight that will be joining us, we have Sarah Megan Thomas, who produced wrote the screenplay and co-stars in the film, a triple threat. I think that's what you call someone like Sarah. Um, and then Lydia Dean Pilcher, who was the director of the film. We'll be getting to them in a moment. If you're watching us on Facebook, welcome. We love it. Our audience keeps growing just from Facebook alone. But if you can, come to folks.org, F-O-L-C-S dot org, and also give us your email address, because that way it won't be a catch or catch can seeing us on Facebook you may not realize in advance you'll get automatic notice of all of our upcoming events. Also, if you have a question for Sarah uh, or Lydia, uh, go to the Q&A button, leave it, and hopefully we'll get a chance to ask them. Um, Sarah, Lydia, welcome. Uh, thrilled to have you both. Um, this is a great film, it really is. It's, um, it's a feminist uh, spy thriller, let me just say right off the bat. Uh, it's a film about immigration. <laughs> It's a film about xenophobia. Uh, it's a film about anti-Semitism. It's a film about disability. It's a film about multiculturalism. It's a, it's a small indie film with like big ambitions. Really, you should be congratulated. It, there's a lot going on here and I, would, I hope to encourage some of the people that have not watched uh, the screening, please go see the film uh, October 2nd. And I think it'll also have eventually a, a video on demand component. So you'll have plenty of opportunities, but it is, an original film, it's a, a intriguing film, and just like all spy thrillers, you know, it, it has you on the edge of your seat. So lots of things are happening. So let's say, it's, it's such an improbable story, although it's true, right? Uh, Hitler is marching through uh, all of Europe, toppling countries everywhere. He finally, he's invaded France. Uh, Church, Churchill's basically uh, in the United Kingdom is fighting alone. Uh, one, the United States is not yet in the war. Uh, you know, he's trying to come up with creative ways to sort of hang in there. And one is to invade France, which is occupied with spies, with a British spy ring. And somebody gets the idea that, you know what, we should have women. Uh, we'll build a network of people who won't be suspicious. As long as they speak French, they'll be great. Uh, of course, we haven't done this sort of thing before. Trained women to be spies during a war, uh, during wartime. It's probably never happened in history, certainly not in an organized way. And here's the kicker. Uh, the two of the women that have been recruited, one is, is an American uh, with a disability uh, who happens to be in Europe and the United Kingdom. The other is, is a Muslim who happens to be uh, in uh, in United Kingdom. And the, the woman who's sort of heading up the whole recruitment process is a Jewish Romanian woman. <laughs> Honestly, frankly, you should show the film to the Palestinians and the Israelis. They should just see the film because it's, it's such a hopeful film that the two, uh, two, of the, two of the female spies, one is, one is the one who coordinates it is a, is a Romanian Jew and one of the ones she ships off is, uh, is a very courageous Muslim woman. So anyway, congratulations. It's a little known story, right? It's a true story. How did we not know about this before? You know, I think it's crazy we didn't know about this before. Um, these women uh, have won just about every award you can imagine, from the Distinguished Service Cross to the Croix de Guerre. I mean, so many awards for bravery, yet uh, no one's made a movie about them. So, you know, when I uncovered their stories, I realized this, this is one that has to be told. And why do you suppose it got passed over? Nobody was pitching this, you know, we, we, you know we, we know their stories like, oh yeah, the, that was a movie that was pitched a hundred times, but no one was interested in it, but the world changed and all of a sudden they did. 
or is this really something that Hollywood just didn't think about? I think it's the latter. And I also think something that Lydia and I share is a passion for female driven stories and female driven filmmakers, writers. And I think it takes more women behind the camera to want to tell these stories, which by the way, men love as well to get them out there. What do you think, Lydia? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that we are all sort of increasingly aware that our history books have been told with a particular lens. Um, all of all everything that we read in school and what we learned we learned through a particular lens and now there is a lot more understanding that there are there is a 360 of stories in the world many of which have never come to light because the voices i think of the stories and the storytellers have been undervalued but we hope it's starting to change. I think it is starting to change and it's exciting. And we've also, we've also realized that there's a big female audience that has been untapped for a long time, but it's a very strong audience and women really want to see stories about women. Yeah. So, um, so it's exciting to, to bring these kinds of stories because these women in particular were very powerful, you know, courageous, fearless in what they were doing. Well, you notice, Lydia, I announced it at the, at the outset as a feminist spy thriller. So it, it clearly, it, it, should be, it, it should be directed to everybody, uh, but women in particular should take incredible pride in this story. Sarah, research, was this something that you had to dig through because no one really knew about it? I read somewhere that you actually interviewed uh, Virginia, um, what was her, Hall, right? Is that her yeah. name? Yeah. So, Virginia so Hall's family, right. She's the American with the disability. Right. Yeah, so I play Virginia Hall in the film and I did get to speak with her living relatives. But to, to back up on the research, it's interesting because the research is there. Like, you know, everyone opened their doors very quickly to me because they wanted a movie to be made about these women. So I got access to their real spy files, which are fascinating in, in the UK. I mean, it includes letters that they wrote back to London. It includes how they were graded as spies. Um, and then the CIA and the OSS, like everyone wanted to speak with us. And then, yes, we spoke with some friends and, and particularly for me as the actress playing Virginia Hall, I spoke with Linda and Lord and Brad Catling, who are her living relatives. And what was interesting about that is the spy files can only tell you so much. And as a spy, you're undercover. You don't talk about it. They didn't give interviews. So to get to the internal um, was a lot more difficult because you're playing a real person, but that material's not out there at all. So right. talking to the family helped kind of dig under the hood a little bit more about who she was. So, um, uh, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about one of the attractions, is, I think, is just people are interested in the idea of the, the improbable person who's doing the, what you would not imagine them to do. I was just thinking about the film that I saw on Showtime recently, uh, with Paul Rudd, uh, the catcher is, was a spy, right? The story of the Jewish baseball player, Mo Berg, who, you know, again, trained by Wild Bill Donovan, same idea, you know, send him off, you're, never, you're probably not gonna come back, here's your cyanide pill. You know, it's such an interesting trope, right? That you really, you picked up on something, both of you, that was, it's there in the culture, so people paying attention recognize, oh yeah, that's right, another example of, you know, it, the, you know, people forget, at, you know, during World War II, it's not like the spy networks were very evolved at all. You know, no one really had, none of, the, none of the major countries had it. They basically built it from scratch. They were figuring it out as they went. So that's why these stories, I think, are particularly interesting. And also as filmmakers, you get to tell it in an original way because it hasn't really been told. And most it's a, it's a fresh story because at the time, no one knew what they were doing, right? Well, you touched upon the screenplay largely takes place in 1941. And, you know, any one of these women who were so courageous can and should have a full biopic. I want to do a mini series, you know, so you can delve more into their personal life. But when you, you do a film in two hours, you have to pick up a, a contained space. And it takes place in 1941, 42, when we were losing the war women were sent in as an experiment. And I think as the writer, what was so interesting to me about that is heroism stepping up to the plate when it could be a total failure. There's, there's, there's no existing spy network. You don't even know if it's gonna work, but you believe so strongly in something that you say yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're watching the film, it's clear and you do both do such a good job of demonstrating 
that they, they know going in, this is virtually a suicide mission, right? I mean, it, show, it must have taken incredible courage. In fact, I think at some point your character, Sarah, is told, you really got a 50-50 chance of coming out alive. And I think statistically, that's exactly what happened, right? Of the 70 people, 35 or something were killed. So you know, it's like- Wireless operators, their average life expectancy was six weeks. They wow. were, they're like, they're, you know, they're transmitting a signal that could point the Nazis exactly to where they were. Yeah. So they were always constantly on the move. It was safer to be in cities because it was hard to figure out where the signal was coming from. But there was a lot of people aiding and a lot of the agents and the supplies and the ammunition was being dropped in fields in rural areas. But the signals were easier to identify out in the rural areas because there were fewer yeah. places to hide. But it was very, it was very dangerous. Right, and you, the film does a very good job of capturing that, that sense of suspense and danger, especially for the signal people, for that very reason, because they're, they're literally transmitting where they are and they better do it quickly. Uh, before we get more into the film, I, I, just, I know that uh, Lydia, you actually think this is a particularly good film for the times in which we live. Can you explain why you feel that's true? Yeah, it, you know, when I first read Sarah's screenplay, I thought, wow, this is kind of a cautionary tale because it, it, it's harking back to a time that, you know, something like the idea of Hitler and the rise of authoritarianism was so shocking and unbelievable. And we always, you know, we always say ne never again. Um, at, but, I, but in the times that we're living in, and I think a lot of it has to do with globalization and the fact that um, I think the, the impact of, vote, of globalization has been that people have kind of retreated into a tribalism, nationalism, extremism, fear. Um, and so as we come now, we've made the movie, it's two years later, it feels like we actually are in these kind of very dangerous um, circumstances that, um, that, that were history up until now. And um, so I think there is a lot to learn. And I think that what, you know, what I find incredibly inspiring about, about these women is that they all came from, um, you know, like we're in a pandemic right now. It's given us a time to reflect. It's given us a time to really think about what matters to us. What, you know, what is our sense of purpose? And they were really driven by an idealism that they had the ability to make a difference. They were, they were well-educated. They came from upper middle-class families. They were linguistically uh, fluent in multi, multi-languages. And Vera Atkins handpicked them for these reasons. They, she knew that these were, the women were sent because they were perceived as being less conspicuous. They wouldn't stand out, they would blend in. But Vera handpicked the agents who she thought would really actually be go, able to go in and conduct you know, subversion and sabotage and organize these resistance cells the way Virginia did. So it, um, it's very inspiring you know, to see that the fate of humanity meant that much because I think in our world today, we could, we could take that on ourselves. Well, we'll get into the actual film more, but I just want to remind the audience that when, when Lydia says uh, Vera Atkins, she's referring to, again, a Romanian Jewish woman who is not a citizen of the United Kingdom, who is working with the very fledgling British intelligence that existed at the time in order to help head up this unit she is not a British citizen. She's a Romanian Jew during World War II, where, virtually, where probably her entire relatives are going to probably be gassed, just to get a sense of the, the power of what this is about, right? Um, and it, maybe it's just something interesting. It, it takes a stranger like her, the foreigner living within the United Kingdom, to have the, in, the, the intuition, right? The woman who herself does not yet feel at home or in place, that, you know, what is, the, it's like, well, what was that talent that she had to figure this out? Well, it may be that she herself was undercover to some degree, right? She wasn't an out, she, right? She wasn't, she wasn't, she wasn't telling, she wasn't telling people she was Jewish, right? They weren't allowed to work for the British government. So she right. was much. Right, exactly. I, I forgot, that's right. You even point that out in the film, that that job cannot be taken by who's a woman who's not, a British citizen who's a Jew from Romania. So it's sort of fascinating to say, here she has this incredible skill of picking the team 
and it's only someone with her background, given who she is and what she's doing, and her own fears of detection, I suspect, that makes her so good at this. You know, for fil female filmmakers, this is such a rare find of material, right? Because if you're saying, I want to make a film about sp women spies, you know, we don't think of women sp spy masters or trade craft, you know? I'm wondering, you know, I'm sorry, I was thinking, I made some notes, like there have been some sort of feature films like Atomic Blonde and Anna and Mr. and Mrs. Smith. So we've seen more and more, I'm trying to think, Red Sparrow, Salt, where we're seeing women but not in this sense, a historical drama that's true, that takes place you know, during World War II. This is really extraordinary material um, and it's done so well. Um, uh, Sarah, how, much, uh, how faithful are the two of you to the film? Uh, you already told us, you know, Thane, it, it's not like you know, they, they, they gave us interviews of what they did. At some level, I had to write the dialogue, I had to actually, Lydia and I had to work through the story. So how much liberties are taken here? You know, that's a great question. Basically, for me as the screenwriter, it was super important to stay true to these three women and even the two lead men who are also one, you know, real people. Um, Can you explain to the audience who are the lead men? Yeah, sure. So. Um, Colonel Maurice Buckmaster, who is played by the incredible Linus Roach, um, he runs the French section of SOE, Special Operations Executive, which is this Churchill secret army. And he runs operations for the whole thing in France. Um, and he was basically, you know, a car salesman who they called up to run this whole thing. Another nickname for all these people were the Baker Street Irregulars, because going back to what you said before, all these people were a little outside the box, right? They were out, you know, a woman with a disability, all, and then they had this extra drive, and, and, and the film shows the power of the individual, no matter who you are. Um, but anyway, that's, that's Linus, and then uh, Russ Eve Sutherland plays uh, kind of a composite of a character, if you will. Um, it's loosely based on the real doctor, uh, Virginia Hall, new uh, in France, who was a local and was her source and, you know, um, helped her meet all the people and provide safe houses, etc. cetera. And, it, and his real name was codenamed Pepin. Um, but I changed his name because we took a lot of liberties with him. And so I didn't want to, to keep the name. But back to your question about how true this is, we're true to the arcs of what happened to every single one of these characters historically. And that was really, really important to me. That said, you know, obviously in the context of a drama, there's, there's fiction and the fiction in this movie or the main fiction in this movie, um, much like Hidden Figures did is people are together in time and space who, who weren't. So Nor and Virginia were two years apart in the war. They never met. But I just thought they were first in their field, the first female field agent, the first female wireless, they're different nationalities, they united to resist. I thought it would make for a more global story than just having one of them. Um, another quick example is Virginia Hall's very famous for a prison break and that prison break could be an entire movie in and of itself. Obvious, at one point, I think it was like an entire landscape in the, in the script, way too long, um, you know. But the point being, it was very important to me that that prison break actually is in the movie. It's just in the movie, totally different than how it happened because we wouldn't have had the space for the way it really happened. Right, and I don't want to give it away, but it, even this, what you just described happens in a very different way. But there is a prison break, so you took, well, that's actually interesting to explain how these things are constructed where you take you know, you're taking, this is, it, it is a feature film, it's not a documentary, and the story has to make sense from a movie standpoint. So there's a faithfulness overall, but there's, it's always times, times and space, I'm told, is oftentimes collapsed, right? Or composite characters is a very common idea, right? Where 11 people become one person, right? So I'm, I'm told historically that happens when it comes to screenwriting. There's this interesting tension in the film uh, that you both do such a good job on, on dealing of the impediments that the obstacles of what a woman would face, some that are obvious like a wooden leg, but others is just the perception of their capacities, right? Which remember, this is the 40s, right? This isn't even today and we know there's still biases and prejudices against women. This is in the 40s, like for instance, are women too emotional for this kind of work? 
are women, can they handle the physical the demands of this work? And I'm wondering whether this is sort of for both of you a kind of a, and also we, we, we're suspicious of them, right? We're suspicious of a Muslim woman. Uh, we're suspicious of one woman who we don't know, she might be a Jew. This, I mean, this is ridiculous, right? Um, you know, and of course we have one woman with wooden leg. So I, I'm wondering, you know, how you address that in the film and how important was that for you to come across to say, look, these women, you know, were doubted significantly. They overachieve in extraordinary ways, but no one gave them a prayer and they didn't even want to send them. Well, I, I think that that's the, that's the fascinating thing about spies because, you, you know, there's an external persona and there's an internal persona. And so there's always, um, there, you know, there, you're always, the spies are always acting. I mean, when Noor went to Paris, she was dressed as a governess carrying her suitcases. One happened to be a wireless radio. And we, you know, we have scenes where she's just walking by police in a park, you know, who would never in a million years suspect that she could be a spy. She's just an immigrant governess walking by. But she's, you know, she's someone else inside. She's just performing that role. But and Lydia, I, can I, can I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, this is very important. You've raised a really super great point. And I want you to speak to this because we're used to spy movies of James Bond, right? That, that's how we're conditioned in film, to, to see it that way. Superhuman acts of physical achievement. But you're saying that almost doesn't even make sense. <laughs> when they were trying to invent this tradecraft, it would make so much more sense not to send someone in who looks so physically impressive that he would be the spy, right? I mean, that's your point, right? She's dressed as a governess, she's a Muslim. <laughs> of course it's not her. Yeah, and, and Virginia's character, I mean I, I mean, I love that, you know, she was an American, so she wasn't gonna be someone passing as someone who would likely be in France. And Vera had a contact at the New York Post. The, he, he, it was a Jewish man running the Post who was very interested in, you know, allowing Virginia Hall to be a foreign correspondent. And it was very- By the way, did she actually have a byline? Yes, okay. yes. Really? <laughs> so you could have been reading Virginia Hall in the New York Post in 1941, 1942. Absolutely. And it, had no idea she was a spy. <laughs> absolutely. And, it, and it's fascinating because that one of the things that the SOE needed, what they needed to know in London is what life was really like on the ground. That kind of information wasn't the kind of thing that could just go in a Morse code message. But Virginia was writing articles where she could really talk about how, what, what life in France was like and what was going and the, intense, the growing intensity of restrictions on the Jewish population, little bits of information that would come through as reportage, which was very significant information for the Nexus back but, in London. They weren't trying to use the articles as another signaling device, right? There, wasn't, there was no code in, this, in the actual articles in the New York Post, right? No, the articles themselves, which are actually in the film, so in terms of truth or fiction, the, those yep. are the real articles, like wow. word, word, that Virginia reported mm -hmm. in the New York Post. And, and there was twofold. So she would get messages to London that were code about what was going on and that couldn't be printed. But even some of the stuff that the New York Post printed um, was, was pretty risque in terms of what she was reporting, she reported about how Jews were being discriminated against. She reported how women were not allowed to have cigarettes, so women were starting to be discriminated against. And then she reported uh, about food, like how she couldn't get chocolate and, and her rations were so small. Mm -hmm. So by publishing it in the, in the New York Post, not only did it keep her cover and let her kind of roam freely because America wasn't in the war at this time, but also it gave London that information because they don't have cell phones, they don't have computers, like no one knew what was going on. And in fact, when Virginia first went to France, she didn't even have a wireless with her. So she was like on her own. Yeah, and it's so interesting because, you know, we live in a world of GPS now, right? And so we're, we're told that Big Brother knows everywhere we go. This movie does such a good job because it's, it, it is literally Virginia who reads British intelligence, the Riot Act, and says, you're screwing this up because you don't have enough signaling people. You don't have enough people. It's not about just having operatives. It's having more people who can actually communicate in code. Right, but you, they didn't know that. It took someone in the field to tell them that. Today we take it for granted. You know, there are all these listening devices 
but you're saying real espionage, what you really need is people to be able to send back, you know, information immediately about what's happened. And yeah. that's her, one of her major contributions to the world of counter espionage, right? She, she okay. taught us that. We, did, we wouldn't have realized that that's actually as important, if not more important, than putting actual people in the field. You know, there's also this other irony, right? The three lead, feminine, fem, fem, female leads have their xenophobia around them, right? About who they are, they're in the United Kingdom. And it's a, there's a you know, little irony, big irony, right? That Hitler is marching through Europe, basically you know, defeating the lower, you know, not the master race, right? The whole not master race was about subhumans. And yet, you know, there's such a, a, a little irony that the women are experiencing these obstacles. They're seen as outsiders, as foreigners, that we're actually fighting Europe and yet we're doing something weird here and not fully accepting the women. We're not accepting a Muslim woman. We're, not ex we're afraid to know that, that Vera is Jewish. It's ridiculous. We're fighting, the, we're fighting Hitler who's, trying to, who's engaged in the Holocaust, right? So there's something really very deep and profound in this film. Uh, that I picked up, I, I thought, wow, that is just a very, you would not have thought that, but it was so clearly in the film, you've embedded it about this suspicions about the other, right? You know, oh, they're the other, can we trust them? So A Call to Spy, uh, great title. Uh, does that mean it's uh, calling all spies, uh, as in recruiting, or does it mean that this was the calling of these three women? It's actually both, so I'm really glad that you got that. <laughs> but yes, you know, we all have our calling um, in life, and I think these these three women and, and everyone in the film who's part of this resistance felt it was their calling in life, their duty in life to do this. Um, they were never hesitant. It was what they knew they needed to do. And then also it's a little bit of a play, um, which is, you know, neither here nor, nor there on kind of the message of communication that is a theme in the movie, uh, you know, in terms of you pick up the phone and you can call someone. Yeah. And they never yeah. could do that. The, the loneliness of being a spy and how hard yeah. it was when they couldn't communicate back with London. Hey, Sarah, that was very deep and I didn't get that one. <laughs> I want you to know the third one was way deeper than it did for me. <laughs> You could have given me a week. I wouldn't have come up with that one. Exactly. No one will. That's just yeah. top secret. <laughs> no, I just, I just want to say that was really smart. Oh. <laughs> and it's top secret. <laughs> um, uh, I'm wondering about, you use the word resistance. Well, actually, before I get to it, let me ask you some, both of something else. Is the movie giving a statement about bravery and courage? Because, you know, given what, even what you just said, you know, we all see movies about, you know, the most extraordinary acts of courage, oftentimes achieved by the most improbable people. Do we have a sense, now that we know that there's a historical record to this, is this, is, are we, do we learn any insight about what separates people who can make this decision versus those who can't? You said, well, they had a calling. And I'm going, really? I mean, that kind of a calling? That's an extraordinary calling, right? Do we, do we have an insight about this? Because I've always found it incredibly mysterious, right? It's a real human mystery. Those who can do it, and again, it doesn't have anything to do about how much you can bench press, right? <laughs> you know, I remember I, after, um, and I'll get back to this other idea too, after Team Seal 6 uh, was involved in assassinating Osama bin Laden, I remember it was this long essay in the Wall Street Journal talking about what does it take to be at that level of the Seal 6 Right. And one one of the guys said who wrote the article, he said he was a SEAL member. He goes, it's not even the best athlete from high school. And I went, what? He said, oh, no, no, no. You think it's the best athlete from high school. Those guys actually never make it through SEAL school. And I went, how is that possible? You know, and so so you can see how you pick that up here in the film, too. So is there any insight about this? I'll let Lydia answer for her, but for me, it's clear it's the underdog. And that's why it's definitely not the best athlete. It's definitely not the person who was handed everything on a silver platter because it takes drive. And all these women were told no, 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 so many times in their lives, in so many different ways. All of them were discriminated against in real ways. And they didn't let that deter them. They didn't let them, that change the goal of what they wanted to do. And I think to have that kind of grit, 
that you need to be at that kind of a level, you have to overcome a lot in your personal life. That's my view. I, I think that's really true for Virginia. But I, I think for Vera and for Noor, there was a moral imperative that really drove them. And it, it had, you know, it had to do, as you said before, with uh, Vera's character, you know, she was Jewish. This had been, this has been, she had been recognized from her work back to Romania um, as a str very strategic mind. And she was, this was something that she was just very committed to. And for Noor, she, you know, this was a time, she came from India. It was a time when Gandhi had started to speak out. Independence of India was on the horizon. Um, I think she felt like she had a moral imperative to do something as, a, as an Indian on the, on the international stage. And so, but, it, but they all had the common, uh, they had the common mission to defeat Hitler. And they had the common goal to do this for for humanity you know for the for the world i mean it was it was bigger than them yeah um the resistance the french resistance I, if you ask me i'm going to say <laughs> that's a challenging subject doesn't have a big payoff not a great part of the war let's be honest right uh you know the french they last about six minutes you know uh to me uh, resistance films, you know, are oftentimes apologies to try to overcome Vichy, you know, because the French are so embarrassed about Vichy, which they should be, you know, the, the incredible amount of collaboration that they participated with the Nazis. Uh, you know, I mean, I, let you, let, I think I've already made it clear. I'm not a fan of the French and World War II, right? I don't think they get, a, I don't think they're, I don't think we even know enough of how badly this was done how horrendous they were during World War II. So I would say it's bad. It's really a challenge, right? Uh, the resistance is largely a failure. Your story, half the people die, right? Uh, you're dealing with, you know, it's the worst place to be a spy, right? Especially if you're in Paris, right? Because you make that clear. Everyone's collaborating with Vichy, right? I and mean, that, that, that one really lovely scene about the propaganda with the show, that's up and then the doctor walks by and he says to the people about Jews, it's such a sweet scene. It was so well done, the two of you. But you didn't, do, you, you didn't very do very much about the Jews. That was plenty, right? That was really well done. It just does it. Well, that's it, I get it, I understand. Sir, that's propaganda, don't listen to that. And then you see that you know, horrible character of the Jewish person. So I'm saying the, the source material doesn't seem winning. <laughs> You know, and I'm wondering whether you thought um, that that was a challenge, right? How do you make heroes out of something that was about capitulation and a collaboration, right? By the way, you know what movie that I compare this to? I think it's a nice uh, compliment. Uh, the Louis Malle's film, Au revoir les enfants, mm. uh, which is really one of my favorite films, but I think they're, they would make a wonderful double feature. Mm. Uh, literally a wonderful, they both, the, the mood, Lydia of the film is a little, the color, the color tones are this similar to me. Uh, anyway, that's just Thane talking, rhapsodizing about your film. But I really do think that it, it, it's that good a movie, frankly. Mm. So anyway, resistance, let's get to that. You know, the, one of the things that I find really fascinating and interesting about the resistance is that it was the last holdout, you know, that for Hitler to come in and actually have really taken over the world. And so I think that, you know, there were, the resistance was comprised of, a, it was a very international group. It was very multicultural. A lot of people came from many occupied countries specifically to try to, you know, beat Hitler back from, from this last holdout. And I think that, um, I think that's a very interesting part of the resistance. I think the other thing is, is that I, that, that part of the goal was, was, you know, the hope was that America would come into the war eventually. And then after um, that small victory in North Africa, it seemed like America was in, and then it was a matter of time. How long could the resistance fighters conduct this sabotage and subversion? They were blowing up bridges, they were blowing up factories, they were undermining the infrastructure that was allowing 
the Nazis to do what they were doing. And the, the, not, the Germans were spending a lot of time hunting these resistance members. Yeah. Really, I mean, over 25,000 resistance members were killed. Over 50,000 were sent to the concentration camps. I mean, I find it fascinating that Klaus Bart, that Virginia's character was known by the Nazis as the limping lady. I saw that. I'm going to talk about that in a minute because I want you both to talk a little about Klaus Barbie. But I was shocked by that. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. That's that's incredible to me that he. I thought I thought Sarah threw that in. (laughs) But it's also it's it's also significant in terms of the amount of power that Virginia Hall had sort of wielded in her position as someone who was organizing these networks of resistance cells and organizing all the all the supplies and the cash and the ammunition that everybody needed to do the to do their work so it was so it was very interesting that klaus barbie actually came to leon with a with a mission to get that limping lady it was i mean quite extraordinary you know let me just say there's an if that's a true anecdote which now i know it is and i'm going to tell people (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it, it's very similar to what happened with Raoul Wallenberg, the Swedish diplomat, with Adolf Eichmann going to Budapest. It's a whole nother movie. Uh, by the way, a film that was never made. It's not done. The Swedes made a film about Raoul Wallenberg. That is a movie that I'm shocked has never been done. But it's a very similar what you're describing. Adolf Eichmann on the end of the war is rushing off to Budapest to deal with this guy Wallenberg who's rescuing 50,000 Jewish Hungarians. He's taken time out of his schedule to deal with this guy. And that's exactly what you're telling me happened with Klaus Barbie. He goes after Virginia, he specifically says, you know, we gotta get this, this, the the lady with the limp. So Sarah, you would say, you would agree that a challenging film, but you don't need D-Day to make a, a, a successful World War II movie. The French resistance has plenty in it. Absolutely. I mean, you know, part of it has to do with budget, right? We're a low budget indie film, right? We don't have a hundred million dollars. We don't have 50 million. We don't have 20 million. So right there, D-Day's gone, (laughs) you know, I mean, but, but that wasn't the reason, so to speak, that we did not have D-Day. I think the main reason for me as, as the screenwriter was that we've seen those movies and they've been done brilliantly. We've seen it in 1917 now, we've seen it in Dunkirk, we've seen the battle scenes, we've seen the best special effects in James Bond. You cannot top that as an independent film. And what was more interesting to me is this thriller psychology. So where our drama comes from, or part of our drama is, are these women gonna live or die? And you care about them. And so it's just a different type of more internal, psychological spy drama. And I think that that's also something that's a little bit missing from the genre, so to speak. You mentioned yeah. Nick Blonde and all these other things. They're romances or they're kind of really thriller with special effects, punching, et cetera, et cetera, which is fun. But it's but we just wanted to do something a little different. Um, and just to touch back on the French resistance, which you asked about, you know, the reason Klaus Barbie went to hunt Virginia is, is because she was an organizer, you know, something that women are frankly really great at, <laughs> you know, we're moms or all these things that we balance. And Virginia Hall organized that French resistance. She recruited the French to get behind this resistance. I mean, Dr. Chavan, Ross Eve's calendar character is a real doctor. She had prostitutes who like would sleep with people and get information, you know, and so that's why she was so dangerous. She could motivate the French as well. And there's something else about women that I want you to talk about. Intuition. We always are told about women's intuition. You know, we always know, I don't, you know, is, is it true? Is it not true? But in this movie, it's there because Vera, and, and, and uh, Virginia, I mean, I, I don't want to give too much up, but there is, uh, you know, of course, if it's a resistance, it's about, if it's a movie about the French resistance, there has to be been people who betray the resistance and collaborators, because otherwise you're not truthful to the story because most of the people in France were collaborators and betrayers of the story. So you have a sort of a double agent, you have a priest here who is a collaborator, and he's the one that betrays the network but it's really the two women that aren't sure about him, right? Everyone else feels more confident. I actually thought there was some statement there about women's capacity to trust, that they might know, you know, the spy game is a game of trust, right? And maybe women have a a special instinct about who to trust, and my intuition tells me 
that guy, because remember, this is a priest. Why would you not? He's a priest who's actually sermonizing about against Hitler, and yet the women are doubting him. So that's true. I mean, Virginia Hall, historically in the spy files, doubted the traitor in this movie, and ultimately she did. Uh, I don't wanna give away the movie, um, but anyway, that is historical too. And I mean, I do think women have, have an intuition. What do you think, Lydia? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely very suggestive, you know, because the doctor has the kind of smug, oh, give me a break, right? This guy's a rock star. He's a priest. Everyone knows him. His sermons are amazing, right? Everyone seems to misjudge him. And the women are the one that going, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not so sure. Give me a moment to think about this. Let's not rush into it. I'm, what is she? Virginia has a great line. She goes, hey, I'm responsible for this entire ring right? I'm not willing to make these casual, you know, decisions. I got to give this some more thought. Um, uh, can we, oh, oh, the, there is, well, I don't want to give away the movie, but I love the fact that you balance the priest with the nuns, right? So, which is also historically true, right? The, 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 the nuns that hid people in the resistance. So you have the priests and the nuns, and it really is, a, it gives a much richer flavor to the movie, of the different, like, this is the same religion, <laughs> it's Catholicism. And the two sides, the, the leaders are split on, you know, whether we're with the Germans or not in the Germans. Talk a little about Barbie. I don't think most people, what you do interesting about the film, much more so with Barbie, and then there's a little with Wild Bill Donovan. One of my favorite moments is when Vera says, oh, hi, w Wild Bill, <laughs> or something. Like you, I love that she goes, you, your, your reputation precedes me, and she says, so does yours, Wild Bill. Uh, <laughs> and I thought, that's Sarah winking at everyone who knows that Wild Bill Donovan is the, you know, essentially the inventor of what became the CIA, but you know, there's, there's only like a thousand people, Sarah, that know that. <laughs> I know, but you got it, so hey. Yeah, I got it, I know. <laughs> I love that, but you were, you were winking at me. <laughs> winking Just at to you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, a lot of movies are doing this. I noticed that um, there are a lot of guys. Alec Baldwin once played Wild Bill. They, he has played, there's he's, tiny roles of this guy is in other movies. Um, tell us more about Barbie, because it's clear he's the real bad guy in the movie, but I don't think people really fully understand who what it was that Noor and, and Virginia knew, like what lion's den they were in. Yeah, I, I had um, done a, an early research and scouting trip to Lyon and um, there is a museum of resistance which was actually Barbie's headquarters when he, when he came into um, Lyon and when, which was, you know, as our, our story had progressed when he arrived. But um, in this, in, this museum was, was a fascinating place because of the history of it. And, and it later appeared in Jean-Pierre Melville's film, Army of Shadows as a military yeah. hospital. Um, but he would, you know, I mean, he is, he's known for, you know, the intense cruelty and um, for just the, you know, the utter, expression of hate on the most in the most demonic levels and in the museum they had videotapes of the of his trials where people who had survived the torture came forward and te gave testimonies and he was there in the room and mocking them you know and it was it was it was just it was shocking it was just it was just one of the most revolting upsetting disturbing things when a person could ever see a, a monster sarah right i read you know uh taking off the skin of human beings while they're alive putting yeah. their putting their heads in pneumonia you know you his know, inter his interrogation techniques you know make waterboarding seem like nothing right yeah, I mean, he was the butcher of Leon, and he right. was, uh, you know, as as brutal as you get. Um, again, for me as the writer, I, I really don't like torture scenes. I don't like graphic violence. Um, for for me as a viewer, and everyone's different. Uh, sometimes that takes me out of the movie, as opposed to to drawing me in. So the challenge was to find. There's obviously a torture scene in this movie. Something that historically happened for the torture scene with him, um, but that was a indie friendly. B you'd never seen before, and C wasn't 
excessively graphic. You know, one of the things I'm really proud of is this movie's rated PG-13, which, which not many um, World War II movies are, and, and it allows, it opens up a window of education in terms of the history to, to younger people. Um, but yeah, so when there is the torture scene, we chose something A, indie friendly, and B, graphic enough so you get it, but not kind of in your face just to, just to overdo it, maybe is the right word. Yeah, and then, and then there's a, you know, people forget or, you know, Barbie was essentially rescued by the American army because they needed him, they wanted him. So the Butcher of Leon, who I think killed 14,000 Jews and resistance fighters, single-handedly, he was responsible for 14,000. The Americans basically captured him to use him in their anti-communist uh, uh, efforts. And then a th thankfully, eventually helped him get to Bolivia Mm -hmm. And then what all I remember about it, which, by the way, I, another, if there's a part two of the Sarah Lydia, you know, collaboration, Sir, Sir, another French, the French Jewish couple, Serge and Bette Klarsfeld, they were a husband and wife Nazi hunting team. They eventually assist in, in bringing uh, Barbie from Bolivia to, to the trial that Lydia's talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for the Klarsfels, well, there's again, there's a movie that's not been made. A husband and wife Nazi hunting team. The Butcher of Leon would have been in Bolivia for the rest of his life had it not been for them. And with this larger history is, is true because we now know more about it because of the trial that you're talking about. So I'm saying that you you introduce a monster in the film and he's so that he's so loaded with his own past that it was so interesting. I hope that people will look him up and say, well, God, you know, what it was that these women were facing, they were literally facing a monster. And now you're telling us that he came back for Virginia. You know, he was literally after this woman. Um, what about, um, uh, you know, here, here's a, a little outside the film. You know, uh, you made a film about Nazis. There's just no question about it. It's a World War II film about Nazis and the French resistance. The words Nazis now are in vogue all over again, not just because of movies, because we're just saying it a lot in the public sphere with respect to our political lives. I'm not asking you whether that helps sell a movie about Nazis, because now people are talking. I'm actually asking a harder question. Is it disturb you that we're invoking those names again in the context of a film that you just made? Do you think that the word is being used too casually? Now, when we invoke it, we say it all the time, right? You see, go on Facebook, you know, Trump's a Nazi, this is Nazi-like, uh, immigration, this is what the Nazis did. We're, uh, we use it all the time, right? And I'm wondering whether you both, because you were so involved in this film, think this is a good thing or a bad thing for the broader culture to be invoking the Nazis. Well, I think, I think the reason that it's being invoked in our, in our current moment of reckoning is because we are, we are dealing with um, sort of an awakening to white supremacy in America and all over the world. And, um, you know, there's a very interesting book by Isabel Wilkerson called Cast that has just come out and she compares Nazism to um, racism in America, both from slavery to Jim Crow to even today, in terms of there being a dominant caste and a subordinate caste. And, and she compares, and there's been a lot of conversation about the comparison to the Nazis. She also, by the way, compares it to the caste system, caste system in India. But um, I, think it's, I think it's a very, um, I mean, I think it really is the moment that we're in right now, and all of it is relevant, and all of it needs to be discussed and talked about where it comes from, the level of hatred, where we're seeing it, the, you know, military, law enforcement, authoritarianism, all of it is, is a relevant conversation. Why do you think that Nazis, just, you just can't seem to get enough of them in film? People are interested in that era, you know? And they, as you said, you've pointed out, you know, there's the, the big spectacle films. I love how Sarah schooled me on Hey, Thane, when you're talking about D-Day, you're talking about 100 million bucks, okay? I hadn't even thought about that. Thank you. You're right. So that's a ridiculous point. You can't do that without a lot of money. But, but you know, we've seen it in various forms. You know, Schindler's List with more Holocaust films. Films, you know, there's so, it comes up in so many ways. Romance stories, 
Um, you know, when it came to post 9-11 films about Islamic extremism, the films that came out in the post-Patriot Act era were much more ambivalently received. Much more, and still are, by the way. You know, you think about The Sniper, many people were like, whoa, I don't know about that. You know, I don't think that's the right thing. Or, you know, these movies were much more ambivalent. Oh, Zero Dark Thirty, forget it. We did an event once with Zero Dark Thirty, and, and frankly, people were upset that we did it. We, when we brought the creative thing, they said, how could you even discuss this with the creative team? We had a former United States Attorney General on that event. How could you possibly talk about a film that had waterboarding in it? So I'm wondering as two filmmakers, two, and real, truly, you're not, just, you're, sorry, you're not just an actor, you're a triple threat, I already said that. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering whether there's something unique about the Nazis that will never go away, at, or, or is there something about post 9-11 that created sensitivities or you know, political correctness or multiculturalism or reasons that you couldn't demonize Islam? I just find it fascinating that we're insatiable from Indiana Jones on, never stop. And when it comes to post 9-11, which is in our lifetime, much more ambivalent. You know, it's an interesting question I've never been asked and honestly hadn't thought about, you know, the post 9-11 aspect of it until you brought it up. Uh, it's fascinating. I, I actually don't, don't know the answer to that one. I don't know. I don't have to think about it. But um, in terms of the World War II aspect, I'm certainly fascinated by all World War II stories. And, and for me personally, I think it's about a, how did this happen? How there was a lot of collaboration and looking the other way that uh, and atrocities that happened for a long time. How did this happen? You know, Hitler told you what he was going to do, and he did it, and yeah. people let it happen. So I think there's that level for me. But then on the positive side, there's so many heroes and individuals that stepped up to the plate and were courageous and um, inspire you that humanity is good and it's it's that battle of good versus evil and i think that is what is so interesting to people in film um lydia i know that was a tough question so i'm not making you answer it i don't know the answer i just i'm always fascinated i'm fascinated by it and i thought you guys are storytellers so maybe you have an insight well i just i think that you know part of what makes world war ii interesting is the global reach of it the story. I mean, it is the entire, you know, it is the entire planet Earth, really, that we're talking about. So, and what's interesting now is that we're in a different era, completely different time, but it is a time of globalization where we're all digitally connected in a different way. So some of these things that were happening in the world in that time are happening now in a different way, but there are le there are lessons to be learned from it, and I think I think that it's in a very important time to to talk about it and to have conversations about it. Um, Dachau uh, was Noor killed by bullet in Dachau. You know, it's it's interesting. The film sort of makes you realize it. Well, wait a minute. So she was incarcerated somewhere in Paris, right, for a while by herself. She obviously did not buckle under any torture. This little tiny Muslim woman, you know, fights through all of God knows what was done to her. Uh, and then she's taken to Dachau. Did she live in Dachau? Was she there for a while before she was killed? Or was she brought to Dachau to be killed? Did you put her in Dachau to just give us the flavor of, oh, by the way, don't forget there were these camps. No, she was, she was taken to Dachau. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so she was also, like she did historically, I mean, the records for Noor are all over the place, to be frank. And actually, there was a fascinating exhibit in Manhattan just last year called Burn Those Diaries um, about Noor at the Rubin Museum. Oh, and wow. what it did is it put on display um, parts of her SOE file uh, so that you could walk through it and see how she was interpreted how they discovered, you know, what happened to her and all the contradictions. So, so there's a lot of contradictions with, you know, what happened to her in the details, but what is 100% true is she did not give anything away and she did try and escape twice. Um, and like Lydia said, she did go to Takao, but, um, you know, it was important to have those details in the film because 
she was courageous. And the, in the files, it says childlike, doll-like. If this girl has brains on Winston Churchill, like terrible, terrible things are said about her as they're sending her off to die. And yet a lot of the men did talk when they were captured. And, and a lot of people did when they were captured, but she didn't. Yeah. All right, I have one last question and we'll take a question for, or two from the audience and we'll say good night. This is just fun, it's, this is really fun. Really, you guys are such great guests and this is such a wonderful film. I'm so, so excited and so proud of the two of you and I want everybody to see it and I hope we've really, I think we sold the movie tonight. I think that's just my thought. Um, the origins of the spy networks. This movie t teaches you a little about that. Neither the British nor the Americans were in the business of this. Of course, there was the FBI, but there was no CIA. So there was something called the OSS that was developed by Wild Bill. And then we see what happened with the British, with the SOE, which I think eventually becomes MI6. Today, there's all kinds of movies and you know, stories about MI6. Everyone knows what MI6 is. Everyone knows what the CIA is. But the truth is we're living in an era when there's, there's a lot of suspicion about these spy networks, right? People don't feel you know, they have mixed feelings about them. You know, they don't feel, do we feel safer because of them? Do we feel the surveillance is appropriate, right? But I, I wonder whether you think in the context of the way, I would say we don't have overall positive image. They make good movies today, but we don't have a positive image. Do you both think this movie is a reminder that there was an astonishing amount of good intentions, uh, how these spy networks were put together? They actually helped save the world from Nazism? I mean, do you think that there's a heroic view of looking at, you know, the origins of MI6, the origins of the CIA and say, hey, you know, you may not like waterboarding or whatever, you know, or, or uh, you know, I'm trying to remember, what is that called? Uh, you know, when they, these, these black, black uh, spots, you know, where they bring, what are they called? Redaction, oh, there you go, redaction. These CIA redaction centers, you know, um, Yes, that's how we, but this is how they started. Do you think there's a redemptive way of thinking about them through this film? I hope so. Uh, you know, Buckmaster himself wrote several books to justify kind of the failures of SOE because there were a ton of failures. And there's many books written about how SOE was a failure, in fact. Um, and then there's stories about how it was a success. And, uh, you know, I believe it was probably somewhere in the middle. They had a lot of failures to get to the successes that they needed, but they didn't have any other option. And I guess the actress in me and the screenwriter in me says like, let's put ourselves at least in their shoes and know that uh, they did have good intentions and um, they did the best they could. And what would you have done when the whole world is gonna be lost and you don't know what to do? You've got to throw, I call it throwing spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. And that is a little bit of what they did. Lydia, do you? Lydia, do you think there's, do you feel that way as well? Well, I think, I think we live in a really complicated world and there is definitely a balance of good and evil and there is um, always gonna be a need for intelligence work. I think for, and, and it just, you know, we just hope that the people who have the intelligence are on the side of the good working against the evil. I, you know, it's a, it's a necessary, um, yeah, it's a necessary enterprise. All right, uh, question. This comes from a Jay Menendez, somewhere around the country. Somewhere, hi, Jay Menendez. Were the Americans, Russians, and French also using women to spy on the Germans, meaning that it wasn't just the British, but were the, when the, well, when the United States got in, were they doing the same things? Were the Russians involved in there? In other words, the, whatever became the KGB, was there a version of the KGB? at that time? Do we know? I don't know anything. I did not do the research on the KGB. Okay. I can tell you that within the SOE and not just F section France, yes, there were, there were absolutely women. Um, Virginia Hall was the first woman to work for the CIA after the war, but, but there weren't a lot of women. Um, Lydia, do you know more? On I, I, I think maybe to the, to his, his question, there, there were SOE um, operations in every occupied country. I so see. it wasn't just France. I mean, there were, they were in Poland and they were in all the occupied countries. So we, we were, we're focused on F section, which was France. And in, in, in our 
our emotional stakes for our women mirror the emotional stakes of the war in that particular moment of our story. Um, so that's, that's, that's our particular bent in the storytelling. Lydia, thank you for reminding me F section because Olivia, our producer and I were banging our heads in the wall trying to say, what was the name of that section again? What was the name of the French piece? Yes, F section. His question comes from Douglas Carr uh, and it picks up on something I think Sarah said earlier, but I like that he asks this question. So much story is packed into a two hour plus movie, meaning your movie, right? That so loaded. With the increased interest in episodic streams a la Netflix, what might you have been able to do if these heroic women's stories were spread over a dozen episodes or more? I guess one question I can extrapolate from Douglas, and I think Sarah sort of hinted at it, you could have gone, you could have made a series, right? This would have worked if you needed to do one full year of it, correct? Or Absolutely, and I would love to do a miniseries spinoff, not just on these women, these three women, but others, you know, uh, what a movie doesn't allow you, you know, Netflix does. And actually we're all getting very used to miniseries. Like when I was growing up, miniseries were not the medium, but I think now they are very, very popular or limited series. So, you know, I set this up for a sequel movie or a miniseries spinoff, but, you know, would let you get into all the details of the home life. You know, there's so much more information that's out there um, that could be explored for sure. All right, so before we say goodnight to Sarah and Lydia, remember, uh, A Call to Spy opens October 2nd. Um, a Call to Spy Movie.com. Uh, a Call to Spy, all one word, A Call to Spy Movie.com is, the, uh, I, is the, the distributor's website, which gives you all the information about what movie theaters around the country are showing it. It'll probably also give you information on video on demand whether or not it'll actually come to Netflix. So stay with this movie, uh, tell your friends about it. I think you know after just watching the last hour, and for those of you who had a privilege to see the advanced screening, it's a special film. It's unlike others, and you'll, you'll walk away better, smarter, and more uh, enlightened about some uh, part of this uh, World War II uh, that you never thought about and that is, was done in such an incredibly uh, meaningful way. Uh, so well done. Um, Let's see, uh, upcoming events. I think we have something, yes, there we go. We have an, uh, our folks conversation series. That's uh, Barry Weiss, uh, who formerly uh, opinion columnist for the New York Times, has a book on anti-Semitism out. Uh, and lots of interesting things to talk with her. We've got other events in the can that we'll eventually tell you about. Uh, remember, folks.org, if you're not already on folks.org, uh, to all of our events are there if you wanna actually watch uh, Lydia and Sarah again, because they were so cool. Or if you want to tell your friends, my God, these two women filmmakers were so incredible. Folks.org, past events. You'll see a call to spy probably by tomorrow or the next day. You'll be able to watch them. and It'll be there forever. Um, uh, <laughs> it will never, oh. it'll, it'll never be. You'll always be able to see it. Your children will see it eventually. Their children will see it. Um, so, uh, Folks.org, if you're not already on our website, on our mailing list, please do that. Uh, and of course, yeah, we're a, we're a nonprofit. We've been open. We've been having charged you at all, all, all throughout the summer since the COVID-19. We've been providing more and more and more meaningful uh, cultural entertainment about the aesthetics of art and the cultural significance of art. And yes, the big ideas of art, which is exactly what folks is about. I, that's what I told Sarah and Lydia uh, it was about. And I think they think they know, yeah, it's about the big ideas. Uh, so if you can donate to us, that's great. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, Facebook, again, if you watched us on it, come back and uh, we'll see you again. Give us your email address uh, on uh, folks.org. Uh, Sarah, Lydia, again, congratulations to the two of you. A Call to Spy is a really wonderful you know, film in every way. It's not a small film. It's a big film with a huge heart and uh, you should both be congratulated for it. Um, so good luck and uh, you know, tell us what your next project is. We'll have you back. You're both such fascinating guests. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Thane Rosenbaum for Folks. Take care, good night. Good night, thank you. Thank you.